Good afternoon, uh, ladies and, and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, final ses set of, of, of session before the grand opening, which is about actually financing the circular economy. I think it has become evident that, uh, that circular economy doesn't really happen as such. There are certain factors that are going to be needed. Uh, and of course, financing investment certainly plays a role. I think that has come out from the, from the di different sessions. When you talk about the financing to the circular economy, you get a bit of a mixed message. So you, some are telling that there's ample amount of money searching for a new home, and there's money around as much as you want. On the other hand, uh, when you talk to somebody, particularly small businesses, they are complaining that it's extremely difficult to mobilize financial resources for what they want to do. And this session is about that. Uh, first of all, whether and how the investment funds, financiers as a whole, because that's, uh, that's the mixed back. I mean, we can't talk about financier uh, as a kind of a general financier, whether or not and how they are now considering circular economy to be part of their investment strategies, portfolios, and, uh, and concrete investments. Uh, but at the same time, of course, uh, I hope that this session will send a message also to the business world that what they need to understand about uh, how to access and mobilize financing, what they want to do. It will also touch upon issues related to what are the incentives for financiers to get more engaged what kind of a role public sector can play, play private sector, and how those can be combined. So this uh, uh, is uh, uh, about uh, financing the circular economy. And actually, without further ado, I would first uh, want to invite uh, Stephen Linter, a colleague of mine from past, a uh, good friend of mine, who has a very long career, actually, at the World Bank. He has left already the World Bank and, for instance, is now advising the Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank on issues related to environment and financing. If I remember right, Stephen is, is kind of a guy. It's, it's a, he, you, you have been a bit like a citra of the World Bank when there is a problem and where new avenues have to be chartered, they have thrown Stephen there to, to get uh, things up and, and, and running. Stephen is going to focus on, on, on the role of uh, development banking, particularly in the uh, developing world, but also in the wider sense. So please, Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Timo. It's an absolute pleasure to be here in Helsinki and uh, to have the opportunity to speak to this audience. I think one of the things that those of us who come from the world of multilateral development banks and bilateral, do bilateral development organizations bring to any discussion is optimism. We're the people who believe things can happen, and I think what's so exciting about this meeting that's being hosted here in uh, Finland is the fact that we've got innovation, we've got vision, and we're also trying to temper that with a sense of realism. The other thing I think is excellent about the meeting is the balance. We have a very, very large number of private sector representatives, and frankly, in terms of moving towards the circular economy, I think the real leadership is really with the private sector right now. Lots of creative thinking, lots of pragmatic decisions, uh, the sessions this morning, for example, uh, at the very beginning, we had people representing companies that had actually changed the way they operated, saw opportunities, and internalized things. So in my presentation, I'm going to talk about financing the circular economy. I'm going to focus on the role of the multilateral development banks specifically. But in terms of looking at this whole question, I think one of the things people need to recognize is there are three very, very large mega development trends going on right now that are driving the way the multilateral development banks work in particular. Uh, these are the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which gave us the SDGs, which are clearly a dominant element of the discussion here. The Paris Agreement on Climate Change with the nationally determined contributions. And then something which has been alluded to, but I don't think has been put up as strongly, 
the tremendous number of global infrastructure initiatives. I'm mostly working in Asia now. Of course, you've got the Chinese-led One Belt, One Road initiative, where President Xi just announced the Chinese would be putting up over $120 billion in supporting that initiative. But there are many other programs, including those uh, that have been developed uh, through the G7 and other parties. But the key thing is these three actions are really driving very much the agenda that's being set by the governments and their interactions with the multilateral development banks and the bilateral development organizations. One thing I'd like to emphasize is these are all the result of successful outcomes of intergovernmental processes. And one thing that you hear about is that cooperation is dead. In fact, I think it's thriving, and these things have gone quite far, quite fast. But what we find ourselves then, where I'm sitting working with multilateral development banks, is having three complementary mandates that we have to integrate, absorb, balance, and actually deliver on. And in addition, we have the famous um, sustainable development goals. And when you actually see them collectively, it's really literally overwhelming. You look at this dashboard, and somehow everything that you're interested in or believe in, including the circular economy, is embedded in here. But the question is, how do, how do people practically deal with this? We've also got three transformative initiatives all running concurrently. We have the green economy. We've got the circular economy we're discussing today. And in fact, in New York, there is the Ocean Conference, which is focusing on the blue economy. The Ocean Conference is co-hosted by Sweden and Fiji. It has eight to 9,000 participants. So what we're doing is we're overpopulating intellectually the territory that we're all trying to deal with, with very good things, very similar, somewhat different, but in some sense is competing, and it's sometimes causing confusion. So one of the real questions is, how do we actually take these initiatives and get a good multiplier effect out of them and benefit from the diversity of visions and the energy that's associated with each one of these? Now, in terms of the multilateral development banks, they are engaged in the circular economy, largely in dealing with questions of effective use of resources, energy, water in particular. People think about these banks, but they normally don't see a big picture of them. Uh, there are over 20, but these are just some of the ones many of the people in the audience might be familiar with, uh, including two based here in Helsinki, the Nordic Investment Bank and the highly innovative Nordic Environment Finance Corporation. So even in this city, you have got some of the really strong but specialized development banks. But what's going on right now is that the banks are picking up different pieces of the picture. Most of it they're picking up through these questions related to the links with climate change. But then they're also involved in dialogue on the circular economy. For example, the World Bank has been working with the government of China in coming up with a circular economy approach focusing on the issue of better resource use, better resource efficiency. This has been complemented by work the Asian Development Bank's been doing at the provincial level in China, looking at a province, this case, Qinghai, and the west of China, looking at the same question. You've had the uh, Inter-American Development Bank working on the question of circular nature of water in Latin America. Although most people wouldn't perceive it this way, Latin America actually has severe water shortages that are projected to be even worse. So one point that I want to emphasize is with regard to the multilateral development banks, they need to respond to requests for support from the public and private sector. And one of the most important things then is to create a mainstreaming of these approaches. So they're part and parcel of government's plans, government strategies, government's approaches. We also, because of all these different agendas, all good, but all slightly different, we're going to have to have a much better communication strategy on the circular economy to get to where we need to go. In terms of the circular economy, in the case of Europe, we've had some very strong actions taken, largely through the European Union, through the Commission. So the European Investment Bank has been directed to put out and put in place and is now implementing a circular economy finance platform. Uh, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development also has set very clear targets. So these, in fact, have become laboratories for looking at the application of these approaches. 
I do want to note, though, that they've been undertaken in a highly structured and regulated setting. So it's not the free-for-all you frequently see beyond uh, the sphere of uh, Europe. But I think this is very important. In terms of the types of interventions the multilateral development banks bring to the discussion of circular economy, one is policy dialogue. And this is a place where the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, Inter-American Development Bank in particular have a big role. What kinds of policies should you have? Country and sector strategies, the tools that are used to build this in. Supporting investments, dealing with financial intermediaries, and this is one of the ways they're able to provide support for the SMEs, who are one of the key elements here, but greatly underfunded. A lot of work with guarantees, green bonds and credits, and also looking at procurement. How do you get the right kind of procurement? Something that's, of course, been debated, how do you move to green procurement? which frequently turns out to be quite controversial. Although, again, Denmark's made real strides on green procurement, as has uh, New Zealand, for example. Uh, they support communications and outreach and partnerships. And I think one of the key things is partnerships heavily now are focused on public-private partnerships. How do you leverage public money, match it with private money? How do you split uh, work in ways that give you comparative advantage? In terms of the funding, most of the funding that's linked to circular economy as we would define it in this room, because these institutions are not involved in manufacturing, with rare exception, really is focusing on renewable energy, energy conservation, power system upgrading, rehabilitation, huge opportunities in municipal finance with the extreme movement of people into urban areas, energy transport, water and wastewater, solid waste management, urban development. This is going to be probably one of the biggest themes these banks will need to be working on. Industrial energy use, transport infrastructure. Uh, I rode in on the train uh, from the airport here into Helsinki. You know, that didn't exist 10 years ago. The types of urban transport systems like you're seeing here are multiplying. Almost every major city in India is switching to having a metro system now. So major, major investments in more environmentally friendly, more, less energy intensive transport. This is going to be a very big feature. Water resources management. Water is going to be a huge problem. And people are recognizing it's, it's going to be, I think, an under-recognized theme of the global, uh, global circular economy. Uh, so what I'd like to say is the multilateral development banks are very actively involved. But I'd like to also point out that they are driven by the demands of clients. And so getting this concept mainstreamed with the public, with governments and the private sector is a major theme. Getting it mainstreamed will be absolutely critical, but it'll also mean we need to communicate more clearly and more effectively what is being done, why, and what the benefits are. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, when you actually arrived uh, here, uh, I was asked you know, how to recognize you, that, and they told that, uh, that he looks like a Santa Claus. <laughs> well, you were not Santa Claus in your, your, your presentation, though. Uh, uh, mainstreaming, I think that was the key word that you, you used in your, your, your intervention. But we will have come back to, to, to these issues. I would now actually want to invite uh, 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 managing director and also the head of uh, sustain sustainable uh, uh, MEA sustainable investments or stewardship from uh, a world biggest uh, 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 investment fund, BlackRock, totally different world from 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 Stevens world, uh, and uh, Amra is going to talk to us about uh, sustainability in, uh, from her perspective. So Amra, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much. And uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this fantastic event. Um, just being here early at lunchtime, there is so much positive energy. Um, equally on a lovely, lovely sunny day in Finland. So again, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'll spend next um, 10 minutes talking about 
what circular economy, or as we call it, sustainability, means for mainstream investors like BlackRock. And I will start by literally spending no more than one minute explaining who we actually are. Um, we are the largest investment manager in the world. Um, as of end of first quarter this year, we managed around 5.4 trillion of US dollars. Um, it's really important to highlight that we are not a bank. Uh, we don't do anything on behalf of BlackRock balance sheet or on BlackRock balance sheet. Everything, literally everything we do, we do on behalf of our clients. So our clients are pension funds. Our clients are savers like yourself who have worked your whole life to have a good retirement. And the money that you have entrusted to us, it's the money that we are investing on a day-to-day basis. So if you look at, we are investing across different asset classes, of which vast majority of those assets under management is invested in equities. Second largest is fixed income, but we are also a large investor in real assets, including infrastructure and renewables. So how does circular economy, or again, I will use the word sustainability, is embedded in what we do? Mainstreaming of some of these topics is a process that, that has been taking place for quite a few years now. And I believe that we have reached the stage where talking about sustainability within the mainstream investment process is not new. There was a period of time, maybe five or eight years ago, when I would talk to um, different market participants about the role of corporate governance. And people were still trying to understand, but what does it really mean for investment process? I'm pleased to say that we have moved away from that, and I think that the, that the topics around sustainability, most specifically environmental, social, and governance, are now well recognized and well established in the investment process. Just to illustrate that with the following slide, I have tried to put as much as possible on this slide, but you can see it's already very crowded, and by no means it includes everything that has taken place over the last 20 years. But if you look at on the left-hand side, you will see there is a lot of um, NGOs, uh, um, different organizations who have started a number of initiatives, such as Global Reporting Initiative back in 1997. The Netherlands have actually, back in 1995, started their own green investment initiative. So if you move fast forward to last two or three years, you will see that the policy makers and regulators are starting to take a, a much more clear role in actually forwarding the debate and forwarding the thinking and forwarding the tools, if you want, that will support investment into sustainability. So what do I do? What does my team do? What, you know, how do we fit into 5.4 trillion of US dollars under management? We work across all our assets under management. And if you look at this chart, I've tried to simplify something that for a long time was actually not that easy. Because BlackRock is a mainstream investor, so vast majority of our clients are investing in so-called mainstream investment strategies, which do not carry any specific environmental, social or governance uh, element. But there is a part, which we have established two or three years ago now, that we label impact platform, where we do offer products and solutions for those clients who have a strong view or feel very strongly that their investments need to be made with specifically targeting certain environmental and social outcomes and report on them. So what do we do on a day-to-day basis? The team is spending time talking to companies. And that's simplifying what we do to the point that we are looking to incentivize companies to think about their own sustainability over the long term. Our clients are savers who are saving for their pensions, so they are long-term investors. And we are working with companies to foster the same thinking. So our chairman and the CEO and the founder, uh, Larry Fink, has written over the last four or five years a number of letters to global companies 
Uh, and in the last two letters, in 2016 and 2017, he says he's specifically looking and asking for companies' management and boards to articulate that long-term strategy and how they are going to achieve their long-term strategic goals. And when companies think about their long-term strategy and long-term strategic goals, they need to reflect on things that are changing the world we live in, technology, innovation, and the impact that these have on human capital, i.e. people like myself and you who are working, and how technology and innovation is changing the way we work on a day-to-day basis. We also work with policymakers and regulators on the issues that we believe can influence what we do on behalf of our clients. On the second slide, I included some policy and regulation that is emerging. But let's just use an example of shareholder rights directive that has been debated at the European level for a number of years. And specifically, the requirement for non-financial disclosure by companies. But also certain markets like France is now requiring investors like ourselves to report how we take environmental and social issues into account or, or, or topics into account in our own investment process. For our equity position, my team is responsible for voting. So we vote on holdings that BlackRock had in companies that are invested in on your behalf. And voting, while an important legal tool that we have, it's something that I like to call sometimes our big stick. So we, our preferred way with working with companies is through engagement, influencing change through conversations in private. But voting can be used, and we do use it in those cases where we feel that that engagement is not working or progress has been too slow. Some of the topics that we, have, we are prioritizing for 2017 and 2018, and you can see some of the, the topics are probably something that I've been looking at for a number of years, and they will remain our priorities for years to come. But there are others that are specifically included here, such as human capital management, very much thinking about what I earlier said, how the key global trends are changing the way that we all work and the impact it's going to have on the human capital management, impact it's going to have, therefore, on employment and more broadly on global economies. Disclosure of climate risks. It's really important that the private sector, on behalf of our clients, is continuing conversations with companies around the disclosure of climate risks. We have participated in a number of organizations, global organizations, including a, a task force for disclosure of, the, of climate, change, and climate change under the Financial Stability Board umbrella to really create a global framework that will help companies to disclose information around their business and what does climate change means for their own business, but also thinking about scenarios uh, in terms of moving to low carbon economy. I'm going to stop here, but I will use next just over a minute that I have in kind of connecting this to Stephen's remarks. I think all of us, private sector, public sector, policymakers and regulators, have a really this circular economy trend forward. And I think the, the roles that we have, we really need to think about how we can use who we are in the best possible way to participate in this global trend. And from where I'm sitting, the trend is very clear. We are moving forward. But the pace and over what period of time and how that is an accelerate is something that we are all looking to understand better. So apart from continuing on the same journey, I think education is really important. So the, the sessions like this are absolutely critical in actually continuing to educate each other and, change and exchange perspectives on such an important topic. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Amra. Uh, I think uh, issues like disclosure, transparency, uh, uh, 
strategies that uh, are set by somebody else, not yourselves, play an important role. I think there was an important message that you said that uh, things are, actually you concluded that things are moving forward and everybody needs to play, find their role in, uh, in that. Uh, let me perhaps then ask you both a few, few questions. And I actually would want to start by asking Stephen first, uh, what would be your expectations towards an institution like BlackRock or similar block private sector financing? I mean, what would you tell to Amra here that he could take, she could take home from, from this conference? Well, first of all, what I want to tell her is I agree that we're going in the right direction. We've all got something to contribute, and we have to define partnerships mm -hmm. in ways where we recognize diversity of approaches, diversity of entry points, and diversity of clients is a strength. Mm. It's a tremendous strength. The other thing that I think would be very important would be to have BlackRock work with its counterparts uh, that are in the same sector as they are and work to promote the types of practices that she's talking about, which is how do you develop within a structure a sustainability window because not all investors are going to want to do that, and it's mm -hmm. quite reasonable, but you want to create an option. That's important. How do they also work with the transparency? Because one of the most important things that I've learned in my career is that transparency is critically important because what it does is it reduces, it does not reduce uh, totally, but it reduces the doubt people have about the effectiveness of interventions. And the types of reporting on environmental, social, and governance that she's talking about in her presentation, I think are things that all institutions involved in finance, be they publicly or privately owned, should do. And again, I think what BlackRock can do is to continue to contribute to innovation in how that's done and in ways that are timely and cost effective. Because it's easy to say you'll do it, it's hard to actually do it. Thank you, Stephen. Perhaps I reverse now the question mm -hmm. to Amra, because how, how does that sound? But also, I mean, do you work with the World Bank? And, and, and is there any kind of a link? And of course, I mean, what institutions such as World Bank, which is in effect government, intergovernmental public sector finance, what they could do to kind of a help you to move forward on circular economy or sustainable investments, as you, as you put it? So we work uh, across a number of um, international and multinational organizations in different capacities. Um, and I think multinationals have a really important role to play, particularly in developing markets where a mainstream investors um, are looking for reassurance, if you want, uh, for investments and also in teaming up and understanding around quality of disclosure because for us we want to be able to understand that investments that we are making that they are transparent that there is information provided around these investments so i think you are frontline <laughs> and i think you have always played an important role in if you want um, education but also mobilizing mainstream investors because of the role you play in the in investment in, in investment world. Thank you, Amra. Let me perhaps then try to dig a bit deeper. I think you both touched upon the mainstreaming issue. Of course, it's all good to have good pilots, best practices, but when we talk about circular economy, they are still in the margins. And of course, I was quite interested to see that there is this window in the black rock already coming up. Uh, but I mean, how would you go about further? I am just kind of I want to tease you a bit further of, of, of really kind of a proactively look at uh, the, the, the uh, strategies and programs of your institutions. And I guess, Stephen, you can still talk about the world back or, or, or your new new advisory roles, how could, what you could, you could do proactively in a sense to inform your shareholders or your governments to, to, to really uh, 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 get the message through that this is the, the, the future. I mean, you mentioned already education and events like, like this, but perhaps I would ask uh, Stephen to, to try to respond to that. 
Well, I think in all the multilateral development banks, whether it's in a long-established bank like the World Bank Group that's existed for over 70 years, or the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which has existed for a year and a half, I think the role is important that they all play, and that is to have a voice on which directions can be taken. Now, the importance of multilateral development banks is because they're owned by countries, their executive directors, when they establish policies or endorse strategies, provide an opportunity for a debate. And so one of the things I think is important is when you're developing a strategy, be it a water strategy, uh, be it an energy strategy, that the types of concerns we're talking about get tabled and debated, and then once the strategy is approved, then that becomes a reference point for public and private clients to understand where the institution's going. Uh, if you look, for example, at the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank's energy strategy, which will be discussed by the board actually next week, uh, it's basically saying it's a design to support the SDGs, uh, it's designed to support the Paris Agreement, energy for all, and that it wants to deal with questions such as energy conservation, the use of renewables, these types of things. So the signaling is there, and I think that signaling is very important uh, because it starts to tell the parties, the clients, what is of interest, what is of concern, and in some cases, what is not to be considered for financing. I think from our perspective, it's really important to make sure that some of these investment opportunities are attractive for our clients. Because going back to my earlier point around um, who we are and what we do, we don't, our clients don't come to us with a blank check. We have mandates to deliver on those, man and we have to deliver on those mandates. So making sure that the opportunities that exist um, are presented or potentially create opportunities for our clients. And I think about can the Capital Markets Union discussion that talks a lot about SME and pushing for more investment in SMEs, and we are big supporters, but at the same time we recognize that you know, we need to focus on capital in Capital Markets Union. In the other words, making those investments really attractive. Um, and then the, 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 the second point is, Education is really critical here because we have, as you can see, created a, a whole product platform for our clients, i.e. we are happy and we can provide client solutions. But our clients also need to be attracted to those solutions and be prepared to invest in them. So education along the investment chain, asset owners, asset managers, consultants, it's not just about one group, but actually education across the whole investment chain is really important. Thank you. Uh, let me pick up what you just said and perhaps put my final question to, to you, you both. Investment opportunities need to be attractive. And I, I, I guess that's the name of the game when you talk about uh, investors, financiers. Uh, uh, could you perhaps... Uh, and of course, I mean, you touched upon an important issue of SME funding, which there's, I think we are going to touch upon that in the, in the next, next uh, uh, panel here. But I mean, could you perhaps uh, uh, continue? I think you both touched upon that already. I mean, which type of investments, I mean, if you would be, from your perspective, and you see and understand what circular economy is all about, where would you go for? I mean, what would be something that you would go for? And I don't really want to get an answer that uh, give me a investment without risk and good returns and I'm ready to finance it. So Stephen. Well, first of all, the multilateral development banks are predominantly lending to governments and they have sovereign guarantees. But so I mean, they're, how... managing, they're managing risk through the sovereign guarantees, which is distinctly different from their private sector arms or certainly the type of operations my colleague at BlackRock is involved with. I think when we look at projects, independent of a sovereign guarantee or not, the real issue is, does the project have merit? Is it substantive in terms of its contribution to development, to the economy, 
Uh, is it sustainable in terms of its financing? This is particularly an issue when you're investing in municipal uh, operations. Is there a revenue stream that can at least do the operation and maintenance? And do you have counterparts who either at the start or with capacity building, training, can actually effectively implement it? You know, you and I worked together on the Baltic Sea. And when I went out to do the original work on the Baltic Sea, we drove all the way from Helsinki, all the way around the Baltic Sea, came back to Helsinki, a complete 360 degree trip. We went and we met with municipal councils. And one of the ways we identified the first investments for the important HELCOM-led program of cleaning up the Baltic Sea was based on the commitment of mayors and municipal councils to engaging in the hard work of the cleanup. So I think those are the kind of criteria I believe are critical for the success, public or private. Unfortunately, I can't be that specific because, as I said, we have mandates. Our clients give us mandates. And we don't make strategic asset allocation decisions. We make tactical. So within the mandate that we have from a client, then we determine what right investments uh, we can make under, under the, the, the limitations or, or opportunities that exist within the mandate. So, but there isn't one model that will fit all our investment teams, and I would be very clear about that. Well, that's actually fully <laughs> understood, so then we need to focus on, on your clients, really, and kind of influence them. Well, I think we are running over the time of, of this session, so I would actually want to thank both of you, Stephen Amra, for this rather, to my mind, uh, revealing of, uh, of the thinking behind what, what, what you are working on and, uh, and also opening to all of, all of us what is actually happening in, 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 in your institutions. Uh, and the picture, I would actually want to conclude what actually Amra said, that things are moving and of course then, then Stephen reinforced. So let's just give a big hand to both and I thank you so much. So uh, now the, the, the program will continue and let me invite the panelists, all of them actually here to, uh, I, I will introduce you when, when you are sitting there, just please join me here to, to continue the debate and discussion on the financing. So the uh, topic will continue because we have a, a, a mixed pack, actually, of, uh, of, of people from this different perspectives uh, working on issues uh, related to financing, from the range of uh, pension funds into the targeted funds, uh, 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 as well as also the company representatives. Uh, uh, we are going to run this session in the, man in, in the manner that I will ask each of you to give your pitch on what you see in terms of uh, the need to focus on when we want to mobilize resources for circular economy from your perspective. And, and, and then I will continue by kind of a teasing you with, with my questions. So I would actually want to start with, uh, with uh, 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 Petri Alava, actually, who is not really a, a financier, so he comes from a business side. So he represents uh, small and medium-sized enterprises here. He's a, he's a founder of a SME, but I understand that you are also uh, uh, in the boards of several other companies. So, uh, I mean, from your perspective, uh, how do you see the circular economy moving forward? You, you can, if you want, you can sit down. Okay, I'd actually love to stand. Okay, rather. that's fine. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Great pleasure, great pleasure to be here. Um, some years ago, uh, my sons came back from, from school, and they said, okay, they, they actually had a chat with the teacher, and the teacher has been asking to tell to the, the other classmates and the, the teacher that what, what your father is, is doing for work. Uh, can, can you help? Okay, I, I tried to explain my biomaterials bi, bi business I was running, 
they didn't understand. Okay, so I, I was actually working as the chairman of the board for a waste company. I said, okay, tell them that, that, that your, bo your, your father is the boss of a waste company. I said, ooh, ooh, no, no, it's, it's dirty, we can't do it. Everybody would laugh, laugh, at, laugh at us. Now then, when I'm telling that I'm back in the waste business, this time working with the uh, industrial uh, process where we can actually produce cotton, new cotton from waste, like old clothes and, and uh, paper waste, cardboard waste, and that actually I'm working every day with the famous brands, globally leading brands, that, wow, that is cool, that's really cool. So actually I've been evidencing a great change in the, in the attitudes, particularly of, of the younger generation. We older generation have actually wrong beliefs. When I'm, I'm asking people that are, how much of, of the textiles is being recycled, everybody believes that there's very high level of recycling. Hard fact is that it's only 20% of textiles being recycled. And Europe, US is, is not, not better than that. Uh, the business problem we have is that if you look at the traditional manufacturing using relatively cheap uh, natural resources and raw material for some textiles business, you have been developing that high scale, very high scale uh, industry in 100 years. We should be jumping that high speed train in, in much shorter than 100 years. And, and the financing problem what we have is actually relating to that. So if you, if you actually um, split the financing problem into two stages, one is, is, is coming from a small scale into a medium-sized industrial scale, and then bringing from medium-sized industrial scale into a high-volume business, a 1 billion euro business. There exist good, good structures for funding when you need 100 million or 200 million or 300 million euros to build a big plant. There exist funds and there exist EIBs and so on. But the problem is actually relating that when you try to finance your first jump for a small scale into a medium-sized sized business. VC funds would be a natural source of funding, if, but if you look beyond, beyond, actually the standard funds, what they have, they have a life cycle of, of 10 years. Our kind of, of high growth state is about seven years from, from now on. So actually it doesn't fit to their criteria. Secondly, there is actually doesn't exist that, that many clean tech uh, focused uh, uh, VC companies. What I've seen lately is that, that corporates have, have taken actually quite a much bigger role, and, and that's the kind of financing we are using in a larger scale. You just need to be fine and finding the, the corporates which have the same agenda than we have, actually can, can share the same, same business model. So what I actually believe that when we want to be creating new industries, utilizing the, the innovative companies, we actually need to be bringing something new, some new structures to finance the first steps without time limit and having a strong focus on, on clean tech or, or, or uh, circular economy. Thank you, Thank you Petri. Uh, uh, small and medium sized enterprises is an issue. I think that was your message and of course the, the challenge of the growth. Let me now invite uh, uh, Lisa. Lisa Bob Villan, uh, and, and, and she is actually a director of sustainability in impact assessment, I impact asset management, if I, if I understood correctly. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for having me here today. It is very exciting. I'm actually from Finland, so it is a real honor to come from London to, to Finland to talk about this exciting topic. So, Impact Asset Management has been focusing on resource efficiency and uh, environmental markets since the late 90s, so for a long time. We are mainly investing globally in listed equities with uh, companies providing environmental solutions. Today we have uh, assets under management of 6.5 billion euros. Our investment thesis is fairly uh, simple in the sense that it's based on well-known uh, drivers and challenges such as population growth, lack of infrastructure, finite natural resources and pollution, as well as climate change. We see companies and invest in opportunities by identifying and investing into companies that are providing solutions into these challenges. Many, many of our companies are focused on energy efficiency, but also renewable energy. 
uh, water treatment, materials, recovery and recycling, but also sustainable food and agriculture. Trying to really reduce uh, food waste is a big theme for us as well. So resource efficiency and circular economy investment, these are not necessarily always about startups and projects. They can be well-established, profitable, higher growth, um, listed companies. And so in theory, at least, should be quite accessible for quite a few investors. But it is interesting to note that uh, these companies are not always recognized as being environmental solution providers or uh, circular economy companies. They might be within its index uh, listed as industrial companies or materials companies. So in order to demonstrate the positive environmental uh, solutions that these companies provide, we are measuring and reporting the, every year the environmental impacts from our companies and their products. So those would be, for example, net CO2 avoidance uh, by, by the companies in one year, or water or materials recovered and recycled. This data is uh, externally verified, and we really try to get our companies to report on this data so that they can actually be recognized for the environmental solution providers that they are. So how could we bring more capital um, and investment into these types of listed companies? Of course, today's uh, environmental standards are always tightening, and this is helpful, but it is incremental for our companies. What is really needed, and the next step, is to be able to have a price or a cost on activities and companies that um, use lots of natural resources that pollute, etc. Really to get uh, all the companies into, uh, into alignment and have a net assessment of uh, harm and uh, solutions. And finally, I would also say that it should be made much easier for small savers and pension investors to identify these types of uh, investments and strategies that are solution-based. Today, these two are not really finding each other. And there would need to be perhaps labels or accreditations to bring these two actors together. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. An example of, uh, of impact uh, financing, which is a, a, a trend and a cause. I mean, I, I caught from your presentation at least several messages, but one, all companies doesn't need to have to be circular economic companies. There's a lot of interesting things happening in a wide variety of companies, and of course you are sensitive to those as well. Let's move on, because the time is running. So now we actually want to invite Frido Kranim, who comes from... Uh, from the from, uh, uh, pension fund world, world uh, Dutch, I think, a very big uh, PGGM a pension fund, who is also working on these issues, as we will hear. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, good to be here. And, and just like BlackRock stated in the first part of the panel, all good things uh, start, start in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, but also, I think, in Finland. And it's very good to be here in, 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 this, in this first forum. And I hope that many will follow in, in, in other places. And, and it was in the first part of the panel, they say it, it's moving. And it's also before, if you were in this room before, before lunch, they stated, well, there's no really, no honest macroeconomic forecast to think that we can remain linear like we are doing today. And the question is not, if we go to a more circular economy, the question really is, is how? And we can do it roughly in two ways. We can do it in an unmatched transitional way with a lot of bankruptcies, a lot of economic instability, with a lot of uh, maybe externalities being paid by society somehow, or we can do it more in a managed way. And managed mean a coordinated way and all stakeholders involved. And all stakeholders, not only business or financiers, it's financiers, yes it is, it's also governments and all parts of governments, because I mainly see here the Ministry of the Environment, but where's your Minister of Finance? Or where's your Ministry of the Economic Affairs? Because they also should participate. Um, and there's a broad interest. Uh, sometimes here, and I, I think, uh, Timo, you said it when you started this, if, if investors or banks would be a little bit more lenient, then the uh, circular economy would take off quickly. And I think that's partially true. And I will say first why it's true. And I think 
we often have still linear glasses. So we undervalue really the, the potentials of the circular model. We don't understand really what working capital is when you were pay per month and not pay per transaction. What your solvency issues are, it, suddenly you have credit risk, so how can you cope with credit risk? So we ask all these kind of very important questions, uh, but maybe uh, they are not uh, right. We undervalue uh, this circular model, mainly because there's no track record, mainly because we're unfamiliar with it. And there's some, something else. And when we talk about investors, we always talk, talk about ROI, and that's meaning return on investment. But it's also the risk of inaction. And the risk of inaction here is there are a lot of linear risks, also in our portfolios. And not, we don't have the problem today, tomorrow, or next week, but sometime we will have the linear risk problem, just like we talk today about climate risk. So we need to, to, uh, to work on that. But, and that's my message, no matter how, if every, every financier is a fan of the circular economy, and they're not, I must say, but if it, if it is, still nothing's happening. And because in this current system, the linear companies are favored. We don't pay uh, as much tax on labor as we pay on materials. Um, uh, the externalities are not being paid, or your reverse logistics, when you do it, should be paid by the business model and not like waste. You can throw away things for free. So really, let's make a deal uh, today. Uh, all governments, they work on the level playing field. And we will adapt and learn from the model. And we work that finance will be an enabler and not a disabler as we is today. But really, if we don't do the first, the second is obsolete. Thank you. Thank you, Frida. There was a promise there, what you were kind of a telling. And of course, also, you touched upon the same thing as uh, earlier uh, uh, from the BlackRock side, Amra was saying that education and understanding are really central to move forward with the circular economy. Next speaker is going to be a former colleague of mine, Pavel Misika, who is at, at the moment, he's, sit, he's sitting on a lot of science and research and innovation funds of the European Union, working as a head of unit of Eco Innovation Unit. So, Pavel. Thank you for the floor, Timo. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, yes, I come from a public institution, from the European Commission. I, I worked in uh, Directorate General for Regional Policy for Environment and Research and Innovation. So three big uh, spenders on, uh, on uh, environment-related issues and in, uh, in the past period uh, focused on circular economy. So there is spending of public money uh, in, this, uh, in this area, for example, only research and innovation funds uh, in the period 2014-2020 will be around 2 billion euro. Much more European funds go into infrastructure, uh, like structural funds, building, uh, waste management uh, systems, etc. But all that is invested is a drop in the sea. Much more is needed. And we estimate this uh, at the level of several hundred of billions euro a year to be invested in circular economy projects to, uh, to achieve the full potential of circular economy in Europe uh, at 2030. So we actually rely on, on private sector investment. Uh, so the question is um, how, how we can achieve this, that the, the, the sector keeps the pace together with, with industry and with, with, uh, with policy. In this, uh, in this area. And I, was, um, I would challenge a little bit the, 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 the speakers before. It seems to me that drive towards sustainability and, and non-financial disclosure is very important, but we are dealing with, with uh, more specific challenge. Circular economy is a is, is very specific, very progressive approach to achieve sustainability. And we, I, I believe that financial sector must, should be should be more active and, and to, to find a way how to deal with that. From policy perspective, where the biggest challenge is, is to, 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 to find a way to, uh, to finance those circular economy projects that actually create new markets, bring those actors in value chains who normally don't operate on, on the market. I will give you a few examples from my experience. I was approached by, by paper recyclers, industry, 
to regulate ink industry by by construction uh, material industry to regulate demolition uh, demolition companies etc etc because on the market they don't interact but they need to take uh, they need those actors to take take action and if they collaborate there is profit to be made but unfortunately this is not happening so we still have problem to ident identify such pr uh, project to create revenue streams to to simply create bankable project of this of this of this kind and we need uh, uh, we, we need kind of uh, develop capacity both in industry but also in financial sector to, to work together to, to, to develop uh, and finance uh, such projects to, to, to make those projects bankable. So this is my, my challenge, my, my, my question to the, to the financial sector, how we can even work public sector and, and, and private sector, we can use public money perhaps to cover a lot of your risk in, in such operations, but for me the, this, this will be the critical issue in the future uh, how the financial sector can actually finance this kind of projects and, and how, we, how public and private uh, sector can, can cooperate to, to deal with inherent risks and other challenges of this kind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel, throwing a challenge actually also to, to the other panelists uh, and also being impatient. So you were telling that uh, hundreds of billions are needed or opportunities are there alone in Europe for moving forward with the circular economy. Moving now forward, of course, I mean, from the European institutions, uh, from the European Investment Bank, uh, Director Werner Schmidt is going to give uh, that bank's perspective. European Investment Bank is, is the biggest investment or development bank in, in the world, even bigger than the World Bank, so you have a lot of funding power at least behind you. So, Werner. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me and I'm thrilled. I have three minutes and I will try to convey three messages. First, and Stephen has partly done my job already, introducing the EIB. We are the EU House Bank. We've been funded founded with the other European institutions roughly 60 years ago, and we had last year a lending volume of roughly 80 billion. Now, we are a policy bank, and I would underline we are a bank, we want our money back, i.e. we are providing no grants, but actually we are financing sustainable, viable projects, and that's important actually. We are looking at the projects from a technical, financial, environmental, social, but also from a wider economic perspective. Um, a point also Stephen mentioned, the demand is coming from the clients. We are not imposing the projects on our customers actually. They are coming to us to provide the, um, to, with, with viable business solutions and, op and operations. Now, what I would like to, uh, to briefly mention is why is the circular economy relevant to the EIB? Well, in fact, Mr. Katainen, different, uh, well, we've heard it yesterday also from our former vice president and now soon mayor of, of Helsinki, Jan Wappapori, circular economy is very high on the policy agenda. And obviously, we as the EU bank, we are implementing and providing it and putting it forward, the, um, supporting the economy, uh, circular economy transition. We lend already traditionally in the circular economy sectors quite a lot. In fact, actually, over the last five years, we've been lending roughly um, 3 billion euros. And obviously, we are also with such, a, such an event here, thrilled by the lending opportunities for the EIB. Now, why do we think that the EIB is relevant to the circular economy? That's the third message I want to, to convey. In fact, we, as the EIB, we can bridge financing gaps. We are catalyzing investments also through the European Fund of Strategic Investments, through the Investment Plan for Europe, and other risk-sharing instruments. But besides lending, besides blending, i.e. co-financing with public and, and, and private resources, we are also providing advice financial, but also technical advice to our promoters who might not be necessarily fully clear on what kind of project we, um, and what is needed in order to make a project bankable. 
Finally, we can also contribute, and I hope I will make a small contribution uh, just now, to raising awareness in circular economy, actually, which is on the, on the one hand here, but also I can tell you this is also needed in, within the bank, because actually these concepts, and Stephen very rightly outlined, blue, green, circular, what is this all about? Sometimes for our loan officers, for our credit analysts, is this um, important. Last point I would like to make, uh, circular economy networking and discussions. Um, my department has been quite active in the urban agenda of the EU, the Pact of Amsterdam last year, and uh, we are having one of the partnerships discussion on circular economy tomorrow. Now, if this was too fast, not clear enough, I can only uh, encourage you to look into this, this brochure, which is obviously downloadable on, the, on our website, DIB in the Circular Economy, which says how we finance the circular economy, what we are doing, and obviously I'm looking forward to any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Werner. Uh, European Investment Bank, according to you, is really in the hands of the political leaders of the European Union. You are basically implementing also the policies. And of course, circular economy package in the European context is there also to guide your activities. You referred to some of the other instruments as well. Well, last, uh, but, but not, not certainly least, uh, Andrew Shannon is, is a partner in the Circularity Capital, which is an a initiative in, 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 in UK or in Scotland. You can tell a few words about that more, of really focusing on circular investment. So, Andrew. Thanks. Good afternoon. Yes, I'm from Circularity Capital. We're a specialist uh, investment manager focusing entirely on making investments in SMEs operating in or, or enabling the circular economy in Europe. Uh, we were formed uh, specifically with that focus. We have a team that combines circular economy expertise and network with traditional investment management experience, and we feel that's appropriate because SMEs often in this, uh, in this sector um, need both the finance but also the uh, network in the circular economy but also the operational expertise. So we ourselves have spent uh, the last 18 months or so fundraising for, for our fund. Um, and one of the important kind of uh, foundations that we built uh, with our fundraising was that we were going to be um, targeting environmental, uh, social, and financial returns. And those environmental and social returns um, aren't to be um, prioritized over financial returns. So this triple bottom line of impact was uh, very uh, clear in our mind that through the circular economy you can deliver that triple bottom line without impacting each other. Um, and we spent uh, a lot of time educating uh, institutions about the circular economy and in the end we decided that um, instead of talking to them about the circular economy uh, as a kind of whole, uh, we would focus on where we felt that it created value and how it creates value. And we distilled it down to three value drivers. Um, and those are the bottom three uh, icons on the, on the slide there. So the first is maintaining asset value. If you can maintain an asset or a resource or a, a product component uh, for, for as long as possible, uh, keeping it at, it at its highest utility, then you're capturing value. You're increasing resource productivity. Uh, the second one would be optimizing the utilization of the asset. Uh, again, if you can maximize the utilization, then you're, you're extracting resource productivity. And then thirdly, cascading of assets through multiple life cycles. Again, if you're uh, using an asset multiple times over multiple life cycles, you're increasing resource productivity. So you get the picture. Resource productivity is creating value. And that's essentially what we're delivering, delivering to our investors and what we look for uh, in businesses that we would potentially invest in. Um, uh, so, uh, the circular economy is important, but it's about identifying these value drivers that will um, allow you to generate the financial, environmental, and social returns. Thank you, Andrew.
course, an example of a, a targeted funding arrangements for circular, circularity. Actually, now we have time for maybe, maybe 20 or so minutes to, to, to have a discussion. Or actually, I will put the questions. But if any of you would want to comment first uh, each other's presentations, add something, or just comment or ask, so please feel free to, to do that uh, before I start shooting my, my irritating questions to you. <laughs> Probably not so much, but I actually would want to start with, with Lisa and with, with Andrew, really. I mean, could you tell us, from, from your perspective, how difficult in, in, the, in the present situation for you it is to, to, to find investments where you really could put your money in? I mean, what, what, what is the, how does the market look like? And of course, you perhaps could... Uh, also elaborate a bit further what I asked previously. I mean, which kind of a investments uh, you are really hunting f at this very moment? I, I think that's an interesting for the audience to hear. Let's sta start with Lisa, if you could kind of a, give a reflection on, on, on that. Thank you. So we have an investment universe of uh, 1,100 companies that we have identified as uh, having more than 50% of their revenues from environmental solutions. And in many, many cases, they are circular, uh, and they are certainly focused on uh, resource efficiency. I would say an area that um, is of great interest for us at the moment is the whole uh, electrification of uh, transport. And, uh, uh, transport, of course, has many good examples of circularity. For instance, the recyclability of, uh, of cars, which is a, an interesting example. But at the moment, if really thinking about what is uh, an interesting area, is are all those very specific components required to make our transport system much more uh, clean and uh, really do a much more uh, from ele electricity. So 1,100, that's quite a lot, actually, that, that you are Sorry? working on. 1,100 different yeah. companies. I mean, this is not, uh, not uh, little, it's not any more much. But Andrew, I mean, you have started, I mean, uh, how do you go about the, 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 the finding good investment opportunities? Proactively, reactively, how difficult it is? Sure. Well, clear, we're um, sourcing our investment opportunities from the private market, so they're uh, not listed and, and uh, therefore information is more difficult to, to come by in their smaller businesses. Um, but we've, uh, uh, through uh, internal research and uh, interactions at events like this and, and um, the, the various um, circular economy hubs around Europe have identified around about 750 businesses that we think create value using one of those three value or one or more of those three value drivers I talked about. Um, and we've been to meet um, about 100 of those, um, and we, uh, we've written internal investment papers on about a dozen, uh, and we hope to make our first investment in the next couple of months. Um, I would say that the, um, there is a strong market uh, in Europe for circular economy businesses. Um, not everyone will be funded, uh, unfortunately, um, but that would be the case in any, uh, any SME. Uh, it's, it's in, it is difficult uh, for an SME to, uh, to get funding. Um, Have you found anything interesting here, actually, in Helsinki? Just being curious. I've met many of the businesses before, so, uh, uh, but Finland is an area where we see uh, ripe... Um, uh, but, but also ripe in the conference, because there are businesses from all over Europe. Uh, I mean, you have been talking to them, but I mean, how do you find, I mean, the events like this for you to work on finding concrete... Uh, opportunities? Uh, well, often the interactions start at events like this and then we go to, uh, to meet them uh, in their offices and mm -hmm. understand you know, the nuts and bolts of the business and uh, perhaps even test out their products, um, uh, uh, often uh, without, them, without them knowing, uh, ordering online or, or whatever, uh, so, so we can okay. kind of see how it works in, in the real. Okay, fine. So, Frido. Just would want to kind of a, uh, you, you gave a, 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 an optimistic kind of a view. Perhaps Dutch realities is different from the realities of, of other uh, 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 countries. And, 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 and maybe you are still on your way. I mean, could you actually try to tell us from the pension front perspective, what are the impediments? I mean, what, I mean, what prevents you to, to unleash 
everything that, that you have and moving forward as quickly as Pavel was calling for? Yeah, well, I, I think mainly what Andrew just said. Like many innovations, and we can say, well, we can talk about this circular economy is back to the future, yeah, like, like we discussed uh, yesterday. Uh, but but this is, the many innovations start small. And we're an institutional investor, and we don't do small investments. So that's rather difficult. But we have other instruments, like BlackRock said, we can do engagement. And, and where we're focusing on, because, well, uh, circular economy, uh, somebody earlier said it's, it's almost like a religion. I think that's true. So it's almost that we are a kind of believers sitting uh, here. But in the end, it's a means. And we uh, try to solve other goals. And, and one of the goals, and that's how we are structured. So we do have a, a growing portfolio going to 20 billion euros in, in 2020. And we call it investing in solutions, in societal solutions. And, 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 and circular economy is, not a, is a solution, but it's a solution for, for another goal. And goal can be water, it can be climate. So we try to structure it. If we see circular economy solutions or entrepreneurs uh, are often a solution for these kind of uh, themes. But still, it's hard to invest at this moment because uh, sometimes when you have a lot of believers, uh, they, they think, well, I have a circular idea, so it's automatically a good business idea, and that's not the case. Uh, so uh, we need to have this hurdle first. Is it really a good business idea? And I think my message was that even if you have a good business idea with an excep ex exceptionally good thought uh, business model, then in the end, your linear competitor has more advantages than you have. And then it's hard to put money in when we think on the market you will lose to a linear uh, competitor. So we need to really, and that is, we need to fix that first. It boils down to the to the price structures and cost structures yes. and yes. externalities and all yeah. all 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 that. Uh, Petri, what you have heard now from uh, from the financial sector side, are you any wiser or are you any kind of a more equipped to find money for your company or? or a company of your kind? Right. Uh, not, not really. Um, I've heard these stories many times. Uh, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. There's, there's a lot of, of money available, that is true. Uh, but it's actually for, for a different scale. As I tried to say that, that when you are proposing a project which is 100 million or 500 million, then you have a lot of, of interested worries. But when you are talking about financing need of 2 million, 10 million, somewhere in that region, it is much more difficult. And when you are not generating uh, positive cash flow, um, the financing, what we are using at the moment is, is, is getting financing from corporates. Um, that, that is the easiest way at the moment. We are selling projects to them and uh, they are willing to participate. I actually haven't had any ever business where the getting the customers has, has been that easy. It's, it's they, 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 all the global brands have a major interest on, on this. But, but on the other hand side, I used to be a corporate leader and, and financing was much easier. I haven't had any business so far which, where the financing is so difficult. Isn't that the paradox actually? Getting little money is much more difficult than getting enormous amount of money. I think this is a structural problem. And of course, I mean, before just kind of, I will give you all one final question, if we have time. But, but before that, uh, Werner, actually, I would want you to perhaps uh, elaborate a bit on, on this big uh, EU funding facility, uh, how do you call it, actually, which has been established, uh, particularly also for SME funding, which EIB plays an important role, this Katainen fund or Juncker fund, or how, you, how do you want to call it? Could you tell a bit more about how that works and whether or not there is uh, opportunities also for circular funding? Yeah, I think you were referring to, but if you could tell a bit more about with it. Great, with, with great pleasure. You're, you're referring to the investment plan for Europe, the Juncker the Juncker Fund, and uh, which in fact has three legs. The first leg is the so-called European Fund for Strategic Investments, which the EIB is currently implementing. There we had we received 16 billion from the European Commission grant to be used for first loss piece, so basically to allow us to go for higher risk projects, which was complemented by 5 billion or from the European Investment Bank, so by having, uh, let's say, 21 billion uh, available, we are in intending over the, um, the three years from 2015 to 2018 to trigger investment of 315 billion. 
currently there is the trilogue happening between the Council, the Parliament and the European Commission to extend it to have an FC2, basically to extend it until 2020 and uh, to reach a f an investment of 500 billion. So that's the, what we are we're doing. That is the first leg. The second leg, which is important, is the European Investment Advisory Hub, which is providing advice and uh, both technical but also financial advice through the, through the Innofin advisory, uh, financial advice to promoters who do not know how to prepare a business case who, who, uh, to structure the investments. And last but not least, the third leg of the Juncker plan, of the investment plan for Europe, is uh, the regulatory framework, actually, because obviously unlocking investment potential requires regulatory changes, actually, and there the this is not triggered by the ERB, but there the Commission plays a, a main role, and we are providing evidence from the markets what is happening, what are concrete barriers. Thank you. Perhaps reaching to, to Pavel, and of course, I mean, you want to respond to that, but also, could you, could you then uh, kind of a, I mean, from the European Commission perspective, European, I mean, public sector uh, policy perspective, uh, tell what kind of a incentives could and should be, have been developed and could and should be developed to, to help mm -hmm. these financiers to, 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 to be able to move towards circular economy. Okay, before we speak about incentives, I think that, that we should reflect a little bit those, though, about those problems and barriers. And what we hear from, uh, from our constituency, let's say research, researchers and innovators, when they develop innovative uh, solution, in the, in the circular economy area, they very often face uh, problems to bring this innovation to the market. And one of those problems is, is access to, to finance. And what, what they tell us is uh, very often that it is, uh, it is high level of risk, uh, that financial institutions consider their, their project that, that risky because to uh, no, normal market risk, there are technological risks and uh, so that the, the level of risk of those projects somehow exceeds what is acceptable for, for financial institutions. I, I will give you just one example of one type of constituency that we work with. Within the uh, European Innovation Partnership on Water, there are about 30 thematic groups and they develop uh, projects. There are consortia of innovators. They develop projects and they, they claim they have 40 to 80 projects ready to go to market seeking uh, investment and, and many of them have problem. One reason they say is that, that water price, let's say these pro projects very often reclaim water, uh, wastewater, etc. for use or uh, increase efficiency of, of, of use of water. But, but the benefit, economic benefits are low because the, the, the price of water is very low. It does not reflect uh, very often resource and environmental, environmental costs. Therefore, their projects are not as profitable as, as other, other competing projects. So they are crowded out from investment. And then the, the, the question of risk. So if we understand this problem, then we, we can think about incentives, so what we can, we can do. So, this market failure reflect, you know, that market does not reflect properly the price of the, of the resource. Perhaps regulation may be needed. This is one approach to, to what can be done. And concerning risk and risk acceptance, I, I think that a uh, solution can be that um, where there is public interest for such risky project to go ahead, that perhaps blending public and private finance can work together to, to finance uh, such projects. Maybe public finance can accept the, the, the risk, higher risk than, uh, than private, and, and uh, maybe this, this, this can be the way forward. So we are reflecting how to construct, and we would like to, to work with the private sector to, um, to create such financial instruments that those projects can be financed. <laughs> So thank you uh, for, for those insights. Uh, policy has played and needs to play a role also in, in future to opening the funding uh, possibilities. Actually, I would want to throw my last question to, to all of you, which is a, it's a pretty fundamental question. And of course, I mean, that, that's triggered also by, by reactions from, from this SME 
side of the story. Are the present funding arrangements fit for purpose? Is there something additional needed? I think when you, when you talk with the, with the, and when you listen what, what's happening out there, I mean, there's a lot, lot of, of, of talk about the green bonds, for instance. There's this Global Compact Initiative on green bonds. And of course, I know that some of you are working on green bonds. Guarantee arrangements, mobilize the, 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 the private sector financing, public sector taking guarantees as, as, as an option. Crowd financing. I don't know if many of you went last night to this Allas area. That was totally crowd financed. Basically, just going to the, to the people and, and, and some of them who were interested in putting, chipping in some money, including, by the way, myself. We just put some money in and, and, and it was totally crowd-financed. So, I mean, are there really a need for something additional in the financing sector? And how do you believe how these will grow, if, if any of you have... Uh, any, any, any thoughts of, of, of that? And particular here, I have this uh, in mind, you know, many small rather than, than few big, because of course there's also an opportunity cost and you all, all are, are talk, talking about. So anyone would want to, to, to take, take that? Maybe Lisa. Yeah, if I may. Um, we hear from some of our waste management and recycling companies similar stories to Petri's story. And I, what we hear particularly from them is that banks, uh, well, really since the financial crisis, are not lending in the same way as they did before. And it's particularly in this same small segment, smaller segment of uh, 5 million or 10 million uh, pounds, for instance. And um, what they also say is that banks do not understand their business model. Uh, and I think it comes to businesses that are very capital intense, uh, upfront, etc. These are not understood. So what I think works quite well, and we've seen that in the UK is, for example, the Green Investment Bank that comes in and is a risk sharer and really can give that sort of uh, risk capital upfront uh, to obviously to viable companies and projects. But I think that is a pretty good model because it goes beyond those very small sort of startups to those that really are in this what I would see almost as a funding gap uh, stage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, perhaps, perhaps Frido, if you want to say a few words and then I need to, to, yeah. to conclude the, the session. Yeah, I, I don't think we need new instruments, really. Um, and maybe uh, if you were a kind of had no circular model, you had the same problem. Um, uh, so in the end, and, and, and to respond, is, is this kind of thing market failure? I don't think this is a really market failure. I think it's more system uh, a failure. And, and to, to echo maybe myself again, is, is we, did, we did a study, if you have a toaster in the Netherlands and your net value of the toaster, if you buy it new, is 10 euros, we put 2 euros VAT on it. And if we want to repair it, we put 11 euros uh, on it. And that's, a, that's the reason why everybody, when your toaster breaks, you throw it away, you don't, you don't, you don't uh, uh, buy a new one. And, 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 and really, um, uh, in the end, it's just risk and return. And it's the same for your business. So we treat you, treat you the same like we should treat uh, other uh, business. And there's something maybe wrong in the risk return. And, and, and of course, we can, if we say it's something new, so we should learn about it, let's do that. And maybe if we want to promote it, maybe we combine public and private finance and say, okay, you take the first loss, and then it will be more interesting for us. But I, I really don't buy it that there's something like the financial industry or banks don't give any loans uh, to a, a, a circular uh, business uh, just because they don't like circular. Maybe if, if, if it's, it's education is the problem, let's, let's uh, uh, talk together then. So thank you. Uh, uh so system failure and, and, and perhaps there's something there that doesn't meet each other. I think that's coming across also in the other sessions. Let's then thank the panelists and I, I would ask you to stay there because I'm going to conclude. But let's give a big applause to the panelists. I think this... I hope and I think that this will help to move the agenda forward. It just leaves me to perhaps try to conclude something from this session. And I don't want to, to, to take a, a, a long time, but I, I, I guess what really is coming across, and, and this is nothing uh, revolutionary, first of all, the financial sector can, is playing, can play, and, and, and should play 
increasing role in financing circular economy, also a bit proactive and in, in, a, in, a, in a daring way. I think I would put it like that. So I think, but I, I, we have heard, heard that this bunch here is, is doing that. While at the same time also businesses, they uh, need to understand uh, how to access the finance, because sometimes, uh, sometimes they don't even want to have financing, but if they need the financing, so they need to understand also what is, uh, 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 how to approach uh, financiers, and that's a different world, so that requires uh, understanding of, 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 of uh, returns, for instance, that are, need, to be, need to be there. Uh, uh, the third kind of a, and final, of my conclusion is that, uh, that uh, we are really in the situation where circular economy as a whole, but related financing, needs to move from pilots, from best practices, from fringes, into mainstream. And of course that is going to be our next challenge, and I think it comes across from many, many presentations also here. And of course we want to move forward uh, quicker than we are, so this is going to be, going to be is essential. Uh, uh, and, 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 and linked to that, to facilitate that, and I, I really want to emphasize that I think people use the word understanding, so there isn't really need to kind of a different communities to come together and, and, and really understand what circular economy, first of all, offers as a business, but also then uh, 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 the other way around, uh, businesses be open and ready to convince the financiers to move forward. Perhaps with these words and with these conclusions, I would actually want to conclude this session. Thank you for, for coming, and of course now we have a coffee break, and then uh, the final session of this conference. Thank you. <laughs>